Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Cleosoft with Jeff Markham, who's going to talk today about IP reuse. So Jeff, what sort of problems are we running into with IP reuse? I think mostly it's time to market pressure and people trying to get as much functionality as they can on a single piece of silicon. And to do that, they really need to acquire IP or to reuse IP that they already have within the company. Otherwise, they're not going to make their market windows with any kind of quality. And this gets harder as we start moving down into advanced nodes, right? Because now you have more IP, more real estate, and also new designs that have potentially a lot more IP than they did in the past. Yeah, you see a lot of things, they call them system on a chip SOC designs, where they're packing an incredible amount of functionality onto a single piece of silicon. In order to do that, it, there's a lot of challenges to be able to find the IP that's going to work for that particular process node and to be able to make sure that it's going to work together appropriately. So why don't you draw this out for us? Sure. So Jeff, what are we looking at? So basically, when you start to do IP reuse, there's sort of a flow that a lot of companies come to eventually. And it starts with what are the assets that you're going to have, and that's sort of the, where you start with publishing. So when you publish, uh, depending on the type of IP that you have, you have various assets that you need to bring into uh, some system somewhere that people can find and access. So if it's something like a digital IP, you might have RTL. You need to have more than the RTL assets. You oftentimes have to have test benches. You need to have app notes. You may, may need to have uh, other things that people need to have, uh, timing libraries, etc. And the first thing you try to do is what do you need to publish to make the IP useful out of the gate? And that really requires you know, somebody to take a look at it to make sure that you have all the necessary assets and that you're not having to have people hunt all over the place for it. So that's sort of the first thing that you do is publish. Does this change on each version and each rev of the IP too? Um, usually you start with a core set of assets, particularly if it's RTLs, and then subsequent versions will have maybe some changes to that RTL. Maybe they'll have some other assets that they bring in. Usually what we see is you get an increasing number of documents that go along with the IP that help people understand how to use it and reference designs that you can uh, bring people. A lot like data sheets used to be back when the, uh, the old, old uh, books used to come out. But now you also have a lot more uh, IP on a chip. So you think about an AI chip, for example, or one of the heterogeneous chips. There's a lot of different IP blocks, and you have to now start looking at what's the characterization? How does this block work with this block, right? Yeah, usually there's usually some uh, standards about how IP interfaces with other IP, like Wishbone and other uh, backbone architectures where... You know, these, these uh, IP were intended to work together. So that's a lot of things that you have to capture about that. But IP tends to be, you know, more functional. So rather than having a whole bunch of things together, you tend to break it up into pieces. So you've got a CERDES, you've got a PLL, you've got whatever, um, a processor. And so they, they tend to be categorized by the kind of IP that they are. And one of the problems here is that you have design teams that are spread out all over the world too, right? And you have IP vendors that are spread out all over the world. That, that's one of the biggest challenges we find out uh, with our customers is that they are very diverse. They have a lot of different uh, geographies and locations and they have acquired IP from a lot of third party sources. A lot of times they don't even realize that, you know, two groups have actually acquired the same IP until they start to work together and realize, oh gosh, we bought it twice. Sometimes the vendors are nice and they'll tell you, but sometimes they won't. So how do you categorize this IP? What's, what are some of the nuances there? I think basically you kind of look at the IP, like if it is a CERDES, how many lanes does it have? What are the protocols that it supports, clock speeds? And, and the IP itself tends to drive a little bit of that cataloging. But then uh, sometimes there's, from different vendors, they'll call the parameters slightly different things. So one of the things that you have to do when you, when you find IP and you catalog it into your system is to make sure that you're using the same terminology so that it's easier for engineers to make apples to apples comparisons and they have the types of attributes on the IP that makes that comparison easy for them. Is there any set of, of problems that design teams typically encounter as they're working with IP? I think sometimes it's just incomplete assets. They don't have everything that they need. We see this more with internal IP than if you get it from an IP vendor because they have gone through it a couple of times. But a lot of times when they go in, they just don't have something that they need. It's, is it a timing library that's missing? Sometimes they need to know the quality of the IP. So how many defects does the IP have? And so that helps drive decisions about it may be you know, functionally closer, but in terms of its uh, life cycle and, and maturity, it's not exactly something I want to use out of the gate. So 
uh, that's one of the things you, you tend to try to get that kind of information into a system so that people can, can make those kinds of determinations more easy. And almost all of this is silicon proven too, right? Um, most of it is. I, I think in some of the more soft, soft IIP assets, uh, there may be assets that are on a process that may not have had that many tape outs on it. So, but most of the time, uh, you can tell from the IP that it is uh, silicon proven. That's one of the attributes you tend to want to categorize. Are there different levels of validation for IP? Um, yes, I think the IP supplier, if you buy it from a third party, has some metrics that they produce that let you know how many people have used it and the foundries that they say uh, it's good for. But the foundries themselves may do a second level of, of qualification that says, you know, this particular IP from this vendor used this PDK and we believe its level of maturity is, you know, good or, you know, they, they have various gradations that they apply. One of the big issues in designing SSCs these days is security, which really wasn't a factor in the past. How does the IP enter into that picture? There's really two aspects to security that people have to worry about. The first level is, does the IP itself offer some security features like encryption? And some of that encryption may have uh, export control restrictions. They usually call those ITAR. So that's one level of it's doing a security function. The other aspect of it is how secure is that IP? Are there things that people can do similar to malware where they can put things, uh, either uh, soft uh, programming or encoding or metal options that can actually expose security flaws within the IP itself? So that's another level of security concern that people have to uh, factor in when they're choosing IP. So there's always a value in reusing IP, but what sort of issues do you run into when you do that from design to design? I think the first thing that you find with reuse is um, being able to you know, get the, all the assets and download them and start to use it within your project. That's one level of reuse. And then knowing what your IP has within it is another level of, of concern because you may not realize just because you download the IP that it in turn uses three or four other IPs. And so that's good to know that you're, you know, dependent on that. And that factors into some amount of defect uh, analysis so that you, you want to get a full picture of everything this thing's using and everything it in turn uses and the defects and problems that it has within uh, the IP itself. That's one level of reuse. And then, you know, we often find that, particularly within companies, they'll, they'll clone the IP or they need to make some changes to it in order to make it conform to a new process node. So they'll take the assets tweak it to their use, and then go back through this whole process again of publishing it as a new version or maybe even a whole other IP that's been cloned, and it goes through the cycle of publishing, finding, and reuse again. We've been used to thinking about IP per node, but there's now all these nodelets in between as well. So the, it used to be you'd go from 10 to 7, but now you have 10, 9, 8, 7. What happens right. with the IP? Yeah, there's usually some amount of tweaking that has to happen. And you also see that when you get like high performance options on a particular node that they'll tweak it slightly, change the, uh, the voltage thresholds and stuff like that to get different kinds of uh, performance characteristics. You may have, you know, analog things that come into that node later. And that may require some reworking of that IP. And so you'll tend, they tend to clone the IP, tweak it, and then put it back through the process again. Does that make it harder to choose IP that you're using for a project? Um, I think it makes the uh, choices a little more uh, difficult to wade through sort of the tree because you have to say, okay, here's the core thing. It was a, a CPU, but now there's three or four variances of it. And so being able to easily say, okay, this was cloned from that and here are the changes uh, helps mitigate to that to some degree. But after a IP has been out and used a couple of times, there's usually some variations of it that emerge. Another problem is that IP sometimes is being used now in safety critical, mission critical type of applications, right. which it wasn't in the past. Right. How does that affect what you're choosing? Uh, that really brings in the whole picture of functional safety. And there's a lot of standards that are coming and emerging for automotive, aviation, and aerospace, where knowing exactly what requirements are met by this particular type of IP and what defects are, are covered and what are not covered by the IP is really important. So you know... For example, if, if you've got something that's a neural network that needs to recognize a particular situation, how quickly can it do that? And so you can better uh, understand how well the IP meets your requirements for functional safety, but it's becoming a, a very important part of uh, IP use and reuse.
And you used to be able to keep track of all this stuff on a spreadsheet. Now you have what hundreds of blocks that go into some of these designs. Yeah, it's, it's a very, it's it exhausts the capability of spreadsheets, and that's why you see the market having tools like our Design Hub emerging, where they can aggregate all this information together and keep things like bills of materials, so that you know the full picture of what you're using, and not only what you're using, but who's using you. Because if you find a defect later on, it's important to be able to communicate that to, to the people who need to know. You want to know where to go if you have a problem, right? Exactly. And that's one of the things where tools really help you. Uh, you know, if you go to an IP, you can say, who's using me? Or what am I using? So that if you see something come up in a JIRA bug, you can say, okay, well, does this affect me or does it not? And if you have integrations between your IP support tools and your issue trackers, then uh, you can make that determination much more easily. So let's back up here a second. What do you actually have to think about when you're going into a design and saying, okay, I want to, I want to use this, this IP and I want to reuse it as well. Well, I think, you know, after you've done publishing and categorization of it, the next set, set of issues come up about if it's licensed, what are the licensing terms? You know, some IP vendors will do sort of, you know, company wide licensing that's becoming less uh, of a, of a practice within the company. We're seeing more project specific things where it's licensed for that product. And so you may have things where, uh, you know, you need to call the vendor and say, hey, I'm going to use this again so that you can make sure you've got the royalty situation understood before you use it. Um, the other things are, a lot of times you'll have software, or sorry, uh, the chip architects. A lot of times you'll have. A lot of times you'll have chip architects that will look at the overall design and the choices that you've made of IP, and they may want to weigh in on that and say, you know, this, this looks to me to be a better choice than what you've chosen. And so that gets into sort of workflows and procedures that companies codify in one way or another that say, you know, before you use this IP, you have to do X, Y, and Z. And that's where workflows come in. Does it get more complicated as we get into things like advanced packaging as well? I think, uh, yes. I think as you get into advanced packaging, you have to look at more considerations of thermal, thermal characteristics and things like that, where a high-level architect really is important to weigh in early on before you get too far down the line and realize you've got a problem. And how about the difference between things like soft IP versus hard IP chiplets, things like that? I think the soft IP flows are, are often quite complicated in terms of what it takes to go from an RTL level description down to something you can actually fabricate. And so there's entire tool chains that are involved. And that's part of the qualification of whether you can use the IP is, do you have all the tools necessary to actually take it through the entire flow? So that's another step potentially in a workflow. And uh, our tool has you know automation that we have that's built in that you can uh, program if it's this kind of IP and it uses this kind of thing it will go through certain steps automatically and send emails out and things like that which are built in and uh, but uh, they're they're in some cases kind of elaborate flows to make sure that things are going to work as you expect is it easier with hard IP hard IP is usually uh, very specific to the nodes that it supports and you usually have artwork that goes along with it and so the parasitic situation is very well understood they may have options in terms of metalization and things that you can do that turn on and off certain things. And so that's usually where the variability is, but usually hard IP is uh, much more qualified in terms and quantified in terms of how it works and what you need. Jeff Markham, thanks for a great explanation. You're welcome.